Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Honest Youth Pastor YouTube channel, the channel that helps believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life. Today, we are going to be doing another sermon review, and this is going to be a little bit different than the other ones. I'll explain that here in a minute. But if you've never been to a sermon review, never watched a sermon review video before, basically, we look at different pastors, different churches, and we work through the sermon asking three questions. One, do they read the text? Two, do they exegete the text using culture and context? And three, do they preach? the gospel of Jesus Christ. There'll be a playlist below. You can check it out. Lots and lots of sermons there. Today, we're going to be looking at a sermon that, quite frankly, I was a little hesitant in doing because this particular YouTube channel doesn't have a lot of subscribers. Their sermons don't seem to get a lot of views, which, in my opinion, is actually really good. I don't think they should get a lot of coverage, so I'm a little torn on doing what we're doing here. But we today are going to be looking at a place called the Sunshine Cathedral. And the reason I think we should be looking at it is because, well, uh, exegesis over eisegesis. There's a lot of things that are going to be said in this sermon that I just want to say out of the gate. Like, I do not take this church seriously. Like, it's a joke to me. And I think you'll see why here in a minute. We're not actually going to uh, listen to the part where this takes place, but during the sermon, they read the Quran. Like they just they are including the Quran next to scripture. There's their songs are not even worship songs to Jesus. Like it's just a whole mess. But as always, if you want to watch the whole sermon without my commentary, link will be in the description below and you can check that out. Also, just a little plug here. If you want to pick up yourself one of these stickers, the link for the site will be below as well. And if you want to go above and beyond and be like 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 just an awesome person, you can support us over on Patreon or subscribe on Instagram. It helps us do what we do here. And you get these early. Instead of getting them on the day they premiere, you get them three days early. So that's all the perks you get. I'm not going to keep selling this thing. Point is, we're going to look at the sermon today. And, and in the words of uh, of a quote from the office, who was it? Andrea, I think. I Oh my goodness. That's showing just how long ago I've watched the office. But, but here you go. I don't have a headache. I'm just preparing. Yes. I, I just think we all need to get in that mindset because today you're going to need to prepare. It's going to be just one of those, <laughs> one of those survey reviews. So let's head over to the review screen. Here we are. And once again, you can uh, go ahead and check out this sermon in the links below if you want to do that. Sunshine Cathedral celebrating 50 years Oh my goodness. It's, it, it bills itself as the world's largest progressive uh, queer church. So if you didn't know why I took it as a joke before, now you know why it's a joke to me. Uh, we're going to see why through this sermon. I just want to demonstrate that these churches are out here and sort of as by way of apologetic uh, to, to sort of say, okay, well, this is what they're saying and this is what the Christian faith actually says, right? So let's go ahead and hop into it um, and go ahead and get started here. We're starting at the minute mark, uh, 22 minutes and 56 seconds in. So 22 minutes in roughly, 23 minutes in roughly. Uh, you can start there. This is where the sermon in quote, air quotes, starts. So let's go ahead and get going and uh, let's see what we got. Oh, well, hold on a second. I said that and then now I can't get this thing to go. And we welcome Kathy Tulo from Oakland Park and James from Pompano and Ron and Ed uh, from Poinsettia Heights, Brad from Fort Lauderdale, Pete and Mel and Plainfield, New Jersey, Michael in Memphis, Tennessee. One of the things they do, and you're going to notice this as we kind of work through this a little bit, is that like they know they have an online presence. I would say that's probably where like a lot of they get their views from is online. So they'll like read off at a variety of different times in the service. They've done it a whole bunch before this, where they'll read off names of people that are watching. Um, so like, I, though I would say, and I have said, like online church is not a real thing. Like you're not actually attending that church or not part of that local community if you're only attending online. Clearly, progressives <laughs> do not feel the same. And so they are including these people's names within their service because they're supporting them. Anyway, let's get back to it. Oh, come on, really? I'm sorry, guys. Here we go. 
Chris in Chicago, Beverly uh, from Pacheco, California, Jen from Oceanport, New Jersey, and the Reverend Cindy Lippert from Albuquerque, New Mexico. We welcome all of you. Yay for those people. Um, and of course, we're all glad for all of you here. Would you please join me in the spirit of prayer? Let us dwell together in peace and let us not be instruments of our own or of others' oppression. And now may God's word be spoken, may only God's word be heard. Amen. Now, one of the things you're going to notice here is throughout this sermon, there's a whole bunch of like, it, it definitely has like, like this high church feel, right? So he's got all the vestiges. If you were to go back and they might do some shots, I don't remember. It'll show like some of the other pastors, air quotes again. Um, but there's like a lot of high church stuff going on, like organs, a lot of singing, a lot of the prayer, a lot of the whole motion. Like it, it has this feel of like liturgical uh, liturgy built in into it. Like it has that feel, which I think is it's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. I just don't think it works though. Like it, it has this air of church, but it's not church. Amen. Well, my great aunt Gladys came home early one day. They, uh, she was expected to be out longer and she just came home early to find her sister, my great aunt, my other great aunt, in bed with her husband, my great uncle Arthur. I know, right? Shocking. And um, in fact, my Aunt Gladys was shocked. And she gasped in horror as she started to yell at her sister. She said, Barbara, I have to, but you? <laughs> I enjoyed the uh, old vaudeville jokes uh, because I, I like what they do. Uh, Reverend Kevin enjoys them because he remembers them when they were fresh. But, um, <laughs> but I enjoy them because, especially those jokes about acrimonious marriages. You know, my wife did. One thing I, and you can't see it because I paused. my husband. That, so like that, you, my mother. you see the, uh, the necklace on his, ch I can't figure out what that is. I, it looks like a Star of David. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure it like incredibly matters, but what's incredibly like maybe it does matter. What's interesting to me is what sort of religious symbol is it, right? Is it the Star of David? Is it some other religion? Again, you're when you use the Quran during a Christian service alongside the Christian text as just important. Like I start asking questions. I think it's reasonable. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, if you guys know that sign, I've tried to look it up online. I can't find it anywhere. The closest thing that comes up is the star of David, which I don't think that's what it is. Um, but anyway, just want to point that out. Other in law, the other blah, 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 because by showing what love isn't right, they show us how love is not supposed to work. Love gone wrong. They show us what love isn't, but we remember the apostle Paul, Paul told us what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love is not pompous. It is not inflated. It is not rude. It, is, it does not seek its own interest. It is not quick-tempered. It does not brood over injury. It does not rejoice over wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes, all things, hopes, all things, endures, all things, love never fails. Now, real quick, before he gets into this whole thing, because there's a whole mess that comes after this, I think it's important to note that at least if he uses the text, as we look at it every sermon review, we need to look at the context of the text, which I'll just ruin it for you. He doesn't. So if you go to 1 Corinthians, just the background of Corinth, you know that Corinth is a troubled church. Uh, first and second Corinth, uh, Corinthians give you an idea of Paul's sort of relationship with them. Now, there's a whole lot of context, but let's focus just on 13. So he starts at verse four in chapter 13. But obviously, before that, it says this. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mystery and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. 
If I give away all that I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Then he goes into the passage that he just read, um, all, all of the... Um, you know, what he just read. Then we get to verse eight, love never ends. As for prophecies, they all pass away. As for tongues, they all cease. For all knowledge, it passes away. For we know in part and only prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, uh, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought as a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now I see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide all uh, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now again, contextually in Corinth, they're having issues <clears throat> with uh, spiritual gifts. What's the greatest? Like if you have this, are you better than somebody else? And Paul is getting to the point where he's saying, it's great that you have these spiritual gifts and that you uh, operate in them. But if you're doing so and you don't understand um, that you're supposed to love one another as Christ loved you, if you don't under, if you're not operating out of that, then it's great that you have them, but you're you're doing them out of a place that isn't right. Now, there's a whole lot more we could get into that. This is obviously passage that's used a lot in weddings. Um, sometimes incorrectly. Uh, the whole point is saying that like this is the characteristics of what it is to love as a believer. Um, now, let's see kind of how he takes it and what he does with it. That is so powerful. That is so beautiful. That is so timeless. One wonders where Paul stole it. Uh, <laughs> Paul usually doesn't hit the nail on the head that exactly, right? You know, t Paul kind of dances around and then stumbles on the good stuff. Rarely does he just come out of the gate with boom and it nails it. So as he does in this one, or I think probably he just found a philosopher or poet that he really liked and borrowed quite liberally from someone else's wisdom. In any case, he handed it down and we have it. Love is kind. Whatever else Love is. Love is kind. Now, one of the things, he will get into it here, but I find that interesting that he at least attributes uh, 1 Corinthians to Paul, or he seems to attribute 1 Corinthians to Paul, but he refuses to say that Paul actually was the one that came up with this. Paul is not, I mean, he, he's assuming that Paul stole it, um, basically referencing sort of an axe at Mars Hill where he says, even some of your philosophers say, right, this, this idea that he took it from somebody else and then is attributing it to himself. Interesting concept. I think he's wrong. Uh, but one of the things that is sort of interesting here, even though he thinks he stole it, um, he does seem to at least attribute 1 Corinthians to Paul, which, um, again, depending on what progressive you're listening to, uh, may or may not attribute things or any, well, very few of Paul's letters they'll attribute to Paul. Love is not cruel. It is not self-serving. It doesn't give up. Love doesn't fail. Those who threaten divine uh, judgment and damnation and who are suspicious of anyone who doesn't equate misery with piety, they say of our love gospel that we're one of those feel-good churches. Oh, God, I hope so. I hope they're right. They think they're being mean. They think they're insulting us. I hope they're prophesying. I hope they're telling us either what we are or what we're meant to be and will be growing into. Yes, because you don't need religion to feel bad. You can feel bad all by yourself. That's what dysfunctional families are for. That's... <laughs> That's what bitter dysfunctional politics are for. That's, that, that's what unjust economies are for. Oh, there's lots to, be, to, to make you miserable. Religion shouldn't be one more thing. So yes, may it be so that we are one of those feel-good churches. Or, oh, here's, I love this one. They'll say that we're a woke church. Oh, I wouldn't go to that woke church. Well, guess what? Resurrection people, by definition, must be woke. That's the whole Easter thing. I know we're a few months out, but that's the whole thing, is that Jesus, they tried to kill him, but he got woke again. That's the whole point. The Buddha was asked if he was a god or an angel, and he said simply, I'm awake. 
Buddha means awakened. Buddha is just what it is to live totally woke. Now, one of the interesting things here, again, so we mentioned before, it's at the beginning or near the beginning, you'd have to go back and watch. I don't know the minute mark. They mentioned the Quran, they read from the Quran. Here he mentions the Buddha and, uh, you know, the Buddha principle of being awake, essentially spiritually awake. Now, we don't get a real clear picture, at least in this section, if he thinks Jesus actually rose from the dead. We sort of get a hint that he, he would at least say Jesus kind of resurrected, perhaps. He doesn't say straight out. Um, but now we're integrating Buddhist principles into a Christian service as we've integrated uh, the Quran into a Christian service before. So either Christianity stands alone on the personal work of Jesus Christ, the foundation and sort of the guidelines of that being the scriptures, Jesus' teachings, the apostles' teachings, uh, or it doesn't. Um, you can't say that Buddha's teachings are equal with scripture because they're not. You can't say the Quran is equal with scripture because it's not. Um, and so when you start doing that, you start being what, what the definition of syncretism is, which is bringing other things in and trying to syncretize them together. You would never find this, and you don't. If you study church history, what you will find is that uh, Christians very early on were, um, it, was, it was obvious that they would worship no one but Jesus. It's the centrality of Jesus that made them different. Um, so when the Romans would say, hey, sacrifice to Caesar and worship Jesus, they'd go, no, only Christ is Lord. Um, and they refuse to do that. In fact, one of the a pretty interesting letter I would encourage you to read is from Pliny the Younger to Trajan. And he says, I can't do like, I, I, I've tried to get them to deny Jesus as Lord. And it's actually said among the, like, it, it, I, I believe the way he words it is that it said that Christians, a true Christian will not denounce Christ. Uh, he does admit that there have been people that have denounced Christ, but he says it's said among them that a true Christian will not denounce Christ. Uh, he even goes as far as to saying that he's tortured a few deaconesses, and there's nothing he can figure out, uh, torture-wise, to to ensure that they would deny Christ. He just can't figure out how to do it. Um, so this, this bringing in other spiritual principles from other spiritual practices... Um, is a red flag, like a big red flag. One that you're just like, you're just like, FBI, open up! It's like, it's not a thing that we do. And when you start saying that, it becomes pretty problematic because it demonstrates that you're not holding to the centrality of scripture. When the critics of the love gospel say that, uh, when we affirm that God is love, they will often say, yes, but... We just believe God is love. Our experience of God is God is love. Our understanding of God. The God of our understanding is God is love. Yes, God is love, but ellipsis. God is love, but. And so when we say God is love and someone says, yes, but, what they're saying is, God is love, yes, but, no, she ain't. That's what, that's what the response really is. So that's the little throw in, right? So he just wants to make sure everybody's super clear about how awesome he is by referring to God as she. Um, I think the proper way that we as believers should refer to God is God is holy. Because in his holiness, he contains this love and justice. There is, this, there is the holiness of God that he has a standard. He has revealed that standard to us. Uh, Paul goes as far as the Romans to say that it's written on our hearts. So um, you know when you're going against it, um, and there is an accountability to be had there. This is, again, why when the gospel goes forth, uh, first obviously among the Jews and then into the Gentiles, uh, pagans, um, you, you have this the central truth going forward that Jesus has died for us and risen from the dead in defeat of sin and death. And it is only through Christ that we can be reconciled to God the Father. And it is the central message of, of this being reconciled to the Creator that we were once set apart from because of our sin. Um, that is the message of the cross, uh, is that Jesus has died taken that penalty for us. Um, and in so doing, though he was put in the grave, he bodily resurrected again um, to, to, to show defeat of sin and death. And now because of that, because of him, we can be made right with the Father. And this is the central truth of the gospel. Um, on the whole she thing, God has throughout 
the history of the Old Testament, revealed himself as he. Now, there's a lot of arguments that could be had there um, in regards to um, uh, language and how it was used and all of that. But the point being is that's how he has revealed himself. So this little dig here is a purposeful dig to be like, yeah, I'm not one of those fundies. God is love, but let me tell you why, even though God is love, God will respond in unloving ways to us and require unloving things of us and be cruel and vicious and judgmental and, and jealous and all the things that we've been told love isn't. Yes, God is love, but let me explain that away so that I can still be very hateful and onerous uh, towards you. God is love, but. And usually the but is followed with this. God is love, yes, but love disciplines. Love disciplines. So because I love you, I get to tell you ladies what to do with your bodies. That's just discipline. That's just love. You'll thank so one of the things that he's doing here, right, he's not really defining who he thinks God is. He is he is saying, hey, God isn't what these other people say. Now, real quick, let's just look at the text he's using, okay? It says, love is patient. God is incredibly patient with us in our sin. Love is uh, kind. God is incredibly kind to us. Um, not only just in the person and work of Jesus Christ, but clearly in the person and work of Jesus Christ. God, or sorry, love does not envy or boast. God could clearly boast in who he is. We see a little bit of that in Job, right? Not even, not that he's boasting, but he just simply says, did you create those things? You didn't, Job. You didn't create, you didn't tell the sea where to stop. Um, so he's not even really boasting in that moment, rather just setting the stage of like, you know, do you know who you are? You know who I am, right? Um, so God could easily do that. He doesn't. It says, love is not arrogant or rude. Once again, God, God could, if he wanted to be, be incredibly um, what we might define as arrogant and rude, right? By saying, I am who I am. But God is the standard for that. And he doesn't do those things because he is patient and kind. Uh, love is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Right. These all of these are the definition of how God loves humanity. Right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. I mean, all of this we have to understand comes in the in the package uh, of of who God is. The standard begins and ends with him and what love means. And so. With this, I don't know who, what this guy's name is, but as he's sort of presenting this, he's not saying, well, God is this. He's saying, well, God is not how these other people define him. Um, we know who God is and how he operates because of scripture. Um, we see that clearly. Uh, the early church, the early believers, both Jews and Gentiles, um, understand who, understood who God was uh, via the Old Testament scriptures, right? Um this is how, I mean, Jesus himself says the law and the prophets talk about me, the me being Jesus. And so like we know about who he is and how he operates and what that looks like, um, not only through the Old Testament, obviously in the person work of Jesus Christ. And so when we define love, the love that Paul is talking about here in Cor Corinthians when he's writing to, to Corinth, we're, we're doing that using the definition we understand based upon how God has revealed what love is. Um, so it can't be a culturally shifting thing. Um, though obviously we, we define things through the lenses of our current culture, but it is ultimately defined by how God has revealed himself and what God says different words mean, particularly here, love. Thank me later. Or because, yes, God is love, but love disciplines. So let me tell you, same uh, people have same gender attraction and love for same people of your own same gender. Let me tell you why your love is going to land you square in hell, because that's just the way God disciplines. That's your punishment for love. Seems fair, doesn't it? And I'm just sharing it with you because I love you. Love me less, would you please? Love me less. Be love Disciplines, but it sounds like love torments, if, in your opinion. Discipline means to teach. Discipline, same root as disciples. D discipleship. What are this? So what he's doing, right, is he's now, he's read into the text something that's not there. Paul has defined what love is, right? 
again, contextually, because they're, they're holding their gifts as like, I'm more special than you because I have this gift. And Paul says, yeah, but you have to have the love behind it for it to mean anything. This gentleman has now taken it and said, well, people say that uh, God is love, but love disciplines. And now he is now shifting, right? So he's, we're not on the text anymore. He's now preaching a sermon based upon somebody saying love is discipline and saying that discipline actually helps somebody. So we're not even on the text anymore. So he's going to go off here in a minute and say, well, discipline actually helps and grows people. So if God, if love is discipline, then, you know, this is how love would operate. We have now added something to the text that's not there at all. And you need to see that because a big point, a big like his big aha moment is based on the fact that discipline does this, that, or the other thing. And therefore, if love is discipline, it should operate in this way. And we've now completely removed ourselves from the text entirely because that is not what Paul is saying at all, but also not within the context of what we're saying here in, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. The idea here that I should be able to, uh, that, that a woman should be able to do whatever she wants with her body, aka baby, he's talking about abortion, uh, or the same sex couple should be able to love whoever they love, and there shouldn't be, you know, there shouldn't be any, you know, sent to hell for that, um, is, is pulling out two specific things um, that are really hot in the culture right now and saying, well, if you love me enough to tell me not to do those things, love me less, because if you really love me, aka wanted me to be disciplined well, discipline does this or the other. And he's about to explain that. One, it completely misrepresents the text that's being said. Two, <laughs> there is a standard God has set forth that says this is how everything is supposed to operate. And you can pull those two things out. So abortion and homosexuality, you can pull out and say, well, you know, that doesn't apply here, but they're included in the same list. For example, Paul is talking about abortions, not, but homosexuality is in the same list as gossiping and stealing and, um, uh, and being envious, right? So these are, you don't, you like the, the progressive church and sometimes unfortunately, like the more conservative fundamental Christians don't put all of these in the same category and say, all of these should be dealt with. We pick and choose and kind of pull them out and say, this is worse and that's worse. And therefore this should be acceptable. And this isn't like, you have to deal with them the way the text deals with them and say that, you know, Jesus came and died for all of these things so that you could be set free from all of these things. So you can be reconciled to God, the creator. Um, and deal with it that way. So what he's about to do about this whole discipline thing, I just want to be super duper clear. It has nothing to do with the text. He has added a definition and is now exegeting the definition, not exegeting the text. Disciples, they learn from a master teacher and then they share the message broadly. Disciple, discipline means to teach. It doesn't mean harsh punishment or payback or vengeance or terror or torture or abandonment. Putting a child in time out for five minutes so that it, so that it learns to, to think about its, its actions and, 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 and calm down and, and, and behave in ways that are better for him or her. That's discipline. Why don't you sit this out for five minutes and think about what you did? That's discipline. Or, or, or a curfew. You know what? You, you're just staying out too late lately and, and you're not getting enough sleep. You're not eating right. You're getting behind on your studies. Uh, I need you home by 10 o'clock from now on. <gasps> That's not cruel. That's just discipline. That now, one thing I didn't think about up until this point is that what's ironic here is if you were to actually enact church discipline the way it's supposed to be enacted on things such as adultery or abortion or homosexuality, uh, he would then probably not call that church discipline loving, even though he's saying discipline is loving if you set a boundary. Right? And that's what church discipline is for. Church discipline is not supposed to be some hit you over the head act. It's supposed to be, as he's stating, an act of saying, hey, how about you think about this for a second? Hey, you're going to be separate. Like You need to sit down and think through this because this was the wrong thing to do with the hopes of drawing someone back uh, into the fold via repentance because they've actually considered their actions. Ironically, he probably would not declare church discipline loving, even though he's actually defining church discipline here without knowing it. That's teaching something that will help you. Threats of hellfire and brimstone, that's not discipline. That's psychological warfare. And that leaves no one better than before. Discipline helps. It isn't torturous. It helps. So yes, God loves and love disciplines. Okay, maybe love needs me to take a five minute time out, not an eternity in a lake of fire. 
if I love God just to stay out of hell. Now, first of all, think about that for two seconds anyway. God creates the hell. God creates the rules that if you break the rules, you go to hell. God allows that to happen, right? God set the whole thing up. So now I have to love God so that God won't let me go to the hell that God created because I broke the God, rules that God created. Wait a minute, why? how does God look good in this story? How is so real quick, there's so much here. I hate to keep interrupting, but there's a lot here. Now, what he... So there, there's there's things that he's putting together and convoluting that aren't shouldn't be put together. First of all, there is disciplinary action that Jesus himself gave us in regards to how to uh, you know set apart a brother if they sin against us and then they are confronted about it and they still refuse to repent and there's things that we should do in that way. Um, the believe it's Matthew 18. The, the idea here is that there is church discipline set up. We see that actually exercised or encouraged to be exercised by Paul when he writes to the Corinthian church. I believe it's actually in 2 Corinthians whenever he says, hey, set that man out from you when that man, uh, he slept with his mother-in-law. And the whole idea is like there's, there's church discipline that should be exercised in the hope that they repent and come back so that they don't in the end, in, in the final judgment, um, get, you know, be punished by God. <clears throat> now, there's obviously, uh, there's, there are, uh, there's, there's eternal conscious torment, there is annihilationism, and then there's universalism. Uh, universalism, I think, is entirely just bunk uh, in and of itself, but there are people that hold to it. We actually had uh, two people discuss it. I'll include that in the links below. Uh, eternal conscious torment and annihilationism uh, both seem to line up with scripture uh, fairly well. You can find verses that support both uh, in that regard. The idea, though, in either case is that you are separate from God for eternity because you have disobeyed him. See, the way that this person setting everything up is that God makes the rules and says, you obey those rules or you get punished. Um, and then he says, God doesn't look good in this scenario. I think you are really belittling God when you say that. I mean, th you are talking about the creator of the universe, the one that spoke everything into existence. God has more pool than you. Again, I'll go back to the whole thing with Job, right? Job, God walks with Job in the last few chapters in Job's and go, hey, did you create that? Did you do that? Did you do that? Did you create that? No, you didn't. You did none of it. And the whole purpose of saying like, you're not in control of this. You're not the one that gets the ultimate say. You're not the one that gets to understand all things. You are man, you were created and here are the standards and I am God. I made this and I get to make the rules. And so when you're like, well, that doesn't make God look good. God is the definition of good. He gets to set the bar because he is the one that made all things. Um, and so when God says, these are my standards, obey my commandments, and then gives you an opportunity to repent gives you an opera like a whole set of hey do this don't do that gives us himself and says i'm going to make a way that you can actually be right with me not by regulations and rules and all of this sort of temple thing but i'm going to make a way to where your whole heart your mind and your heart can be transformed and you can follow me and be and pursue holiness uh, and and gives us the spirit to enable us to be able to do that and then we have the audacity to be like, well, he's not fair. Please. Oh my goodness, please. He is incredibly, the definition of love of what we read in 1 Corinthians here, incredibly patient, incredibly kind uh, in giving us opportunity after opportunity to hear of who he is, see that he has provided a way in the personal work of Jesus Christ. Um, and then if we still ignore that, still say, well, that's not good enough. Your rules are too, I mean, it's just, <sighs> please. So this idea of God doesn't look good in this scenario is hilarious to me. God makes the rules. He gets to make the definitions. He has given us more than ample. I mean, you would probably say in Pat, well, they didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have this. They didn't have that. Like he's given us the scriptures. He's given us his word. He has given us more. He's given us Jesus. He's given us the Holy Spirit. Like, I don't know what else you want him to do <laughs> to be incredibly patient and kind with us. 
uh, and provide us a way back to him. Um, he is the very definition of good. This isn't a he doesn't look good in this scenario. It is he gives you an opportunity. He gives you a clear standard, a clear opportunity to be changed so that you don't disobey, so you can repent and be made right. And then when you refuse to do that, you have the audacity to tell him he's not fair. Is this good a good image of God? So if I love to, if I love God though, just to stay out of hell, then guess what? I don't love God. I'm just so terrified of God that I'll do whatever I can to stay on that God's good side. Now that might be the only thing in this entire sermon I actually agree with him with, in the fact in the fact that if you if you're just afraid to go to hell, so you'll do whatever you have to. That is very akin to. Uh, I'm afraid of this person, so the only reason I obey them is because I'm afraid they're going to do something to me. That is not good, um, but that isn't the Christian message. And unfortunately, in some fundamentalist circles, in some conservative Christian circles, that uh, either is purposely communicated or many times it's just not purposely communicated, but that's what people hear, which is why we have to be incredibly, incredibly clear that, that the gospel is that Jesus has come to save us from our sins, uh, save us from the wrath of God, provide us a way to be reconciled. So no, you don't just love God because if I don't, he's going to kill me and burn me in hell forever. Um, you love him because you understand that you de- like your rebellion deserves some sort of punishment. But even though you deserve it, he gives you an opportunity and a way out. And so you love him because of how gracious and kind and merciful he is to you. If I worship God so that God will not abandon me or torture me in another life, that's not love. But if I don't believe in any of that, and here I am anyway, singing my carols, hugging on the people around me, putting money in the plate, volunteer for stuff, bringing food for, for, for the, to, to prevent uh, food insecurity, and I'm coming back on Christmas Eve, and I'm coming to Bible study, and I, if I'm doing all of this just because I like you, and I like this, and I like what we're trying to do in the world, and I like the message, and I like love, I'm not worried two seconds about another life. I'm just trying to squeeze all I can out of this one and do it with you. So that's healthy spirituality versus that I better do something so it doesn't get worse for me the next go round. If I love God to stay out of hell, then I don't love God. I'm just terrified of God. And that's CYA religion, which is the least noble kind. Real quick, he's going to curse in case anybody is listening to this and they don't want to hear it or their kids to hear it, just so you know it's coming. Melody, tell, tell somebody next to you, see why it means cover your ass. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Our gospel of love goes so far as to say that God is love. Not merely loving, but is the presence, the power, the experience of love itself. Let, let me say it this way. God is not a loving person. Persons have, have the limitations of personality. And persons, yes, if I, I can be loving, but I can also be unloving. I cannot be my, the best version of myself sometimes. So God is not a loving person because even the best person who is the most loving will it still falls short of perfection. So when we say God is love, we're saying not a loving person, but the power of love personified. Not a person who is loving, but love itself that we personify. Fear isn't love. Cruelty isn't love, selfishness isn't love, abuse isn't love, and condemning love isn't love. We practice an open communion. Okay, this is about to get pretty interesting. I I want to make sure I make a point of this, but before we get to this whole open communion thing, um, he doesn't straight out say it. And this would be very interesting if I was able to talk to this gentleman, if I could ask him about does he believe that Jesus was fully God, fully man, right? Um, this idea, because he's really, like, really pushes on the idea that God is love personified. So this idea of anytime you experience love, you're experiencing God sort of thing. Um, now, there is a difference between that statement and the statement that many Christians use, which would be the statement of provenient grace, right? So there are graces that God enables us to enjoy, even if we aren't 
saved, even if we aren't his children. Uh, that is the grace of being able to get up every day, the grace of being able to love your spouse, the grace of being able to love your kids. This, These, these joys that we experience as human beings, there are joys that you have even outside of adoption in Christ. But these are prevenient graces. This is a good God giving good gifts to people that are even rebelling against him. Again, this is God, the definition of how merciful and kind God is to people, even those that rebel against him. Um, so it's very interesting because that word usage he used is very much like a Richard Rohr, cosmic Christ, like love personified is God. God isn't like, you can't put your finger on God. He's just kind of everywhere. Um, so anyway, that, that, let's keep going. He's going to be talking about communion. And I, find, I, this is, uh, I really want to talk about this because this is interesting. To enact a love that welcomes all and affirms all. We have a cross, not because we venerate an instrument of torture, God forbid. No, we have it to remind us that the cross failed. It was meant to silence Jesus and his followers, and it failed. It was meant to remove him from the human story, and it failed. It was meant to silence the work of justice love, and it failed. Hate crucifies, love resurrects. We have the cross not because we worship it, but because we laugh at its failure. This is its worst, but look what's in front of it. The cross is behind Jesus. That's already in history. It failed, and the body of Christ moves on with its healing work in the world. Hate crucifies, love resurrects. We wear vestments because, as the prophet RuPaul tells us, <laughs> we're all born naked and the rest is drag. <laughs> There's not really a comment to be made about that ridiculousness. It's just kind of like... <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. So, anyway. And we all want a little fabulous in our lives, but we don't do it because God demands it. And we don't worry for a single second that God has a problem with it. Not this drag or any other kind. God is love, and love is kind. Very few people in, the, in my upbringing ever presented or seemed to think of God as actually being kind. But God is love, and love is kind. Love isn't cruel. Love isn't oppressive. God will never give us up or give up on us because God is the love that embraces us always. And God won't abandon us because that would mean God failed as love but love doesn't fail. So do you see what he's doing? So we, we are sort of in the text a bit. There's a couple th times he's referenced it here in just the last couple minutes. We'll get to the communion thing in a minute because he, he's going to reference it again. But the idea being, and it does, it does actually tie into this love thing. It does tie into this church discipline thing we've talked about before in this video. So you see what he's doing though, like oppression, um, you know, uh, definitely needs to be defined. What does it mean to love doesn't oppress? Like, what would you define oppression being then, right? Uh, what does that look? Would church discipline then fall into oppression? Um, because lots of people would reference it that way that are um, misunderstanding it. Of course, church discipline has been misused before. I think everyone can admit that. Um, but the practice of church discipline itself is actually good because it actually does something good. So let's get over to the second half of the community thing he's talking about. That God is love means we will not be abandoned because love doesn't fail. Doctrine failed us. Dogma failed us. But love cannot fail. The spirituality of love isn't focused on hell or hatefulness, on sin or sacrifice, on condemnation or manipulation. The spirituality of love focuses on an omnipresent love that is the very ground of our being. We are part of it, and we will never be separated from it. If it ever comes down to either embracing an unloving interpretation of Scripture, I hope people are listening in Jamaica, if it ever comes down to embracing unloving interpretation of Scripture, I hope people are listening in Arkansas. If it ever comes down to embracing an unloving interpretation of Scripture, I hope people are listening in China and Russia 
and West Virginia, if it ever comes down to embracing an unloving interpretation of Scripture or simply choosing loving kindness, go with love. And see, this is where the definition, like these are important, right? Defining what love is then and how it operates is crucial. Because if not, whenever he says choose love, and whenever somebody that's more of a conservative Christian or what I would consider biblical Christianity uses the word love, they sound like they're saying the same thing, and they're simply not. His love is acceptance of, a, of everything uh, or many things that the Bible would condemn. And that simply is not the case. Now, again, he would pick and choose, uh, you know, about what should be accepted and what wouldn't. Obviously, he would agree that, hopefully, he would agree. Envy is an issue that needs to be dealt with. Greed is an issue that needs to be dealt with, right? Lying is an issue that needs to be dealt with. Homosexuality is not an issue he thinks needs dealt with. And so, uh, abortion is an issue he doesn't think needs dealt with. So, all of these things are interesting, but when he says love, right, choose that, um, he's he's not being consistent in it. He's just saying all of this and then he'll pick a few things, right? That he, so he probably wouldn't say except, you know, well, maybe he would say except, you know, polygamous relationships. I don't know. Uh, he'd probably not go as far as pedophilia. Maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't. I don't know because if it's just affirming of all things, how do I know where that ends? Um, Whereas we have clear things in scripture, we have lists specifically uh, that Paul gives us in these same letters in which he says, these things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And therefore we deal with those because even after he gives that list, he says, as such were some of you, but you've been freed, right? This idea of that you are not bound to this sin anymore. The gospel of Christ sets you free. You are changed and you are no longer those things and you are sanctified into becoming more like Jesus. And so whenever we're using words like oppression or love or things like this, this has to be defined. And we define it, as I've already pointed out, with scripture and how God has communicated these things to us. We don't define them by culture and context as far as where we're at. Obviously, culture and context play a part, and we have to acknowledge there are lenses there in which we see things through. But we also say, okay, how has God communicated this to us through time, right? So when it says love is patient and love is kind, this begins with God. So if God is love, right, which I would agree with him with in a different way, then how has God demonstrating this love in a patient and kind way? We, uh, we've already talked about that, right? Being patient and kind with us in our rebellion, um, which we have plenty of examples for in scripture. So let's keep going and see where he takes this. You can't go wrong with love. The arrows of biblical archery have wounded far too many. Choose love. Now, when I say things like this, I will be asked, I have been asked, if I'm prepared to take this stand, if this is where I'm going to plant my flag, Love over law, love over tradition, love over dogma, love over any interpretation of any scripture. If that's where I'm going to plant my flag, then what good is the Bible? What a false dichotomy. The zero sum, all or nothing, worship it or chuck it approach is far too limiting. You know what I'm going to do with the Bible? I'm going to read it. I'm going to wrestle with it. So he'll get into this, but he, he, what he's saying is that the Bible isn't the ultimate authority. Like he's going to read it and he's about to say something very revealing. But the idea here is that the Bible, the Bible isn't the standard that God has given us. Rather, it is a good advice book. I'm going to play with it. I'm going to apply it in healing ways. I'm going to disagree with some of it. I'm going to change my mind time and again about parts of it. The Bible is mine to use. I am not its to abuse. The Bible is mine to use. Jesus said the Sabbath is for us. We're not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for us. We're not made for religion. Religion is made for us. We're not made for the Bible. The Bible is for us and we get to decide what to do with it. Someone will then say, and has said, so you're saying you're the ultimate authority for my life? Yeah, I guess I am, I guess I am saying that. And so are you. 
And guess what? Even if you're saying the Bible is your authority, you are saying people you've never met, people you know nothing about, people who are writing anonymously, people who are writing in languages you don't know, people who are, have written documents that no longer exist, so they're hand copies of hand copies of hand copies of hand copies of oral tradition. So you are saying almost imaginary people are your authority. So th this is where, like, clearly the difference is, right? So he is already declared himself, his authority of his own life, where he, he will use the Bible, right? In parts that he wants to use it, but he will not use it in other parts that he thinks are uh, archaic or problematic or culturally bound, essentially, right? Which is, this isn't the argument of a lot of egalitarians I know, but this is essentially the same base argument, that that was a time and a place, and therefore it doesn't apply anymore. Uh, when we're, I'm specifically talking about women preachers. Um, it's the same base argument. Obviously, egalitarians don't take it that far as he's taking it. But the idea here is that he's saying that it's copies of copies. Somebody that I've never met before wrote it. And you're saying the Bible is authoritative to people you've never met in different cultures. Y yes. Like the gospel, as it goes forth in early church history, for example, goes forth all over the world. We got Egypt, we got Africa, we've got over into Russia, we got over into China. like it goes everywhere. And the gospel spreads because it is applicable to all cultures in all times, because everyone is a sinner. Everyone needs to be reconciled to God. And God has given us the way in, into which to be reconciled, right? Through Jesus Christ. So the proclamation of the gospel, as the early disciples take it out, as they dispense throughout the world, the the message is this. We have a creator God, right? This is essentially the Apostles' Creed. God created all things. Jesus has come. He has died in our place for our sins. He has risen in defeat of sin and death. He ascended into heaven. He's coming back to judge the living and the dead again. Like, this is the message. So if you want to be made right with your creator, you can you can do that through the personal work of Jesus. And in doing so, you become part of this, this universal church, this family of believers, this changed people, this people that are pursuing the holiness of God. Well, how do we know the holiness of God? Well, he's given us uh, who he is in the Old Testament and in the New. And we follow him, pursuing after him as a different people that are solely exclusively sold out to Jesus. He is Lord. No one else is. How do we know how to behave and act and do things? He has given us those decrees, right? We have as early as 100, right? 100 AD or thereabouts, the Didache, which outlines uh, what it calls the way of life and the way of death. So this is like the, the Cliff Notes version of, hey, what does it mean to be a believer uh, because obviously by the time 100 AD came around, we didn't have the scriptures yet. We had letters going around that were seen as authoritative, but they weren't all combined together. And we have the Didache, and it outlines, hey, these are the things that Christians do. These are the things Christians don't do. And all of these point back to the teachings of Jesus, some in the Old Testament, some Old Testament scripts, uh, some of what Paul has taught. Like you can see kind of where things are being pulled from. And it's very, very clear that regardless of where the gospel goes, these are the things Christians do and don't do, regardless of the culture the gospel goes into. The gospel goes into cultures and says, you aren't right. Jesus is Lord. Obey him. It is an exclusive claim. And the idea here that he's like, well, it's, it's, it's you. how dare you say that to people that you've never met? It's God says, follow me. That's what he says. And as far as the copies of the copies of the copies, it's we don't have time in this video, but the point is we have um, examples of early tests or early canons within the early church um, in regards to uh, fragments and bits and quotations that some early church writers uh, include in their letters um, that demonstrate uh, that these letters had authority very early on in the church. I'm talking within 100, uh, 150 uh, to like the, this idea that these were already seen as authoritative and being used as such. Um, so this copy of a copy is just a nonsensical argument to me. Uh, obviously, it's an argument that needs to be had, but it's just a silly one. Um, the main point here is this. The gospel has always been a gospel that goes into every culture everywhere and says, Jesus is Lord, follow him. Now, 
That hasn't always been done great by believers. Sometimes it's a forceful thing, and that is not what we see uh, Jesus do. This is not what we see the early church do. They do declare Jesus as Lord. Uh, they don't take it to the extent of say, hey, you do this or you die. Like that's the crusadish thing is a huge twisting of, of, of the gospel. But if you study early church history, what you see is, yeah, no matter where they go, they declare Jesus as Lord. There's not syncretism. There's not a combination of Jesus and something else. It is, exclu- it is an exclusive claim. And that exclusive claim, especially within the Roman Empire, makes Christians very strange people because nobody else does that. And they're looked at as incredibly odd. So really, you're your own authority. You've made up your own invisible one. I just skipped out that step and said, yeah, I'll use reason and decide what works. I'll, I'll, I'll experiment. I'll, I'll put it to use. I'll practice it and see what is good. In fact, the Apostle Paul himself, in one of those five or six times that he really got something right, said to the Thessalonians, test everything and then keep what is good. Yeah, we're testing the sermon and we're throwing it in the trash because it's terrible. I suggest we follow that same advice with the Bible. Test everything. Keep only what is good. I mean, you see the lunacy here, right? You see the you see the ridiculousness of being like, well, I'm going to read this passage, and if I don't like it, I'll just throw it out. How dare you? I mean, that's stupid. I mean, that's just stupid. The Bible isn't my excuse to be unloving. Love is how I choose to make sense of the Bible. And so when I read today's gospel passage, I see love in action. The point isn't about a virgin conception, which is neither biologically probable, theologically necessary, nor unique in ancient literature. One of the things you need to understand is one of the one of the first things that apostates give up is the virgin birth. Uh, usually, the second is the bodily resurrection, but typically, uh, those that uh, call themselves Christians that are not Christians will always give up the virgin birth and almost right after give up the actual physical body bodily resurrection of Christ. The point is, in fact, there are even more exciting stories than this about fatherless pregnancies. Lao Tzu's mother was consumed, was, uh, she became pregnant through a shooting star. Ouch. <laughs> And then she was pregnant for 80 years and finally gave birth to an old man. So, yeah, poor Lao Tzu, poor Mama Lao Tzu, she, uh, I, you know, she had no, no good. Uh, Buddha was born from his mother's side. And he came out walking, and everywhere he stepped, a lotus flower would bloom. But yeah, through the side. So I don't think Mama Buddha had a very great time of it. So these stories aren't, are, aren't unique. They are throughout antiquity. What they mean is the person we care a lot about is really special. So special must have been born special. See, and that you will always hear that, like that excuse that he just gave. So you'll have people that call themselves Christians that will deny the virgin birth, but will use the virgin birth in a way because they have to explain it because it's in the gospel. Um, It's included. Not only is it included within uh, the gospels, uh, but it is also within the Apostles' Creed. And so now you have to, to, to get a, just to do away with it, you can't because you'd be clearly outside of the teaching of Scripture and the creeds. So because it's there, then you have to explain it. And the explanation always is, well, it just means he was special. That's all it means. He was special. He was a special guy, uh, which will inevitably lead you down the path of usually Ebionism, which says that Jesus was adopted at at his baptism. He wasn't actually God. He was adopted uh, because he was so holy and he followed the law right. And he wasn't wasn't actually a deity. He was just adopted because of his holiness Um, is typically where that path goes. But either way, it's denial of Jesus' deity um, in some form or fashion. And it usually comes by way of what he just said. That's what the stories, stories mean. So this isn't biologically probable, theologically necessary, or unique in ancient literature. The point is that Mary is pregnant and her betrothed husband isn't the father. Mary is pregnant and Joseph didn't have none to do with it, and that's a scandal. But look what happens today. When he finds out about it, he responds lovingly. 
At first, he wants to break up with Mary, but even that he wants to do quietly in a way that preserves her dignity, that won't endanger her. But later he changes his mind about leaving her, and he decides they can be a family after all, even though her baby is not his. Love saves Mary. Joseph being loving saves an entire family. Joseph gives Jesus his name. That's important because that means Jesus now belongs somewhere. The, the, the angel in Joseph's dream says, Joseph, you will name him. Like a father does, you will name him. So that Joseph gives him a name, gives him a place in the family, gives him a legacy, gives him a spot. That is important. Jesus belongs somewhere because of Joseph. Now, notice he leaves out the rest of that verse in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Well, he said that part, and then he completely left out, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, that's convenient that we just didn't read the rest of it. This is not simply... Um, this is not simply Joseph just giving Jesus his name arbitrarily. Um, this is Joseph giving Jesus his name. The angel gives Joseph the name to give Jesus, and the purpose of which is because he will save his people from their sins. That's important. Pretty crucial part of this, the, the, the verse there. Joseph's love. Jesus' paternity is in question, but Joseph says, not anymore it isn't. No matter how he got here, he's mine now. I name him, I care for him, I'll raise him, I'll love him. And he names him Jesus, God saves. And as we have come to understand and experience God, that means love saves. Through Joseph, love saves this family. From Joseph, Jesus is named as a reminder that love saves. Now, someone will ask, but what if Joseph isn't real? Some scholars have suggested this, that, he, that it's sort of a midrash, that this is just sort of resurrecting the old story of Joseph from the Old Testament, the dreamer who saves uh, his people, his family, and his people. This is just a retelling of that, that, that this Joseph was probably just made out of whole cloth. What if that's the case? What if this is a character that Matthew made up? So what if it is? Whether Joseph is literal or literary, he still shows the power of love. Don't get caught in the weeds. Did it? Do you see what happens? Like scripture, when scripture is viewed this way, you can mold it into anything you want it to be, right? So if Joseph isn't real, he can be, therefore become an analogy and he can therefore uh, be whatever you want him to be. Uh, you can make scripture say whatever you want it to say. There isn't any, even in a narrative sense, there's no liter, literal part of it. Even though when we look at the early church, there was no indication they held Matthew uh, in this regard as some sort of analogy. There's, there's no indication of that whatsoever that I've read. Please, if you've read it, let me know. I'd be very interested to look at it. But as far as I can tell, Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, was referenced as authoritative very early on. Um, and the idea that you, you know, some historians are like, well, Joseph wasn't real. Like in the fact that this, this so-called quote unquote, you know, air quote pastor here says, well, it doesn't really matter. It's just a example anyway. It's really about love saving things. Even if love in this instant was a made up imaginary dude, it doesn't matter because the Bible, I just take whatever I want. I just, uh, I just look at scripture and I'm like, Hey, you know, what, 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 whatever I want it to be, it'll be. Do you see now why the Angelo quote was so important? I don't have a headache. I'm just preparing. This is just craziness. You view the Bible this way, you are going to end up doing whatever you want, justifying whatever you want, and really being led by the cultural lenses of whatever is good or bad and you deciding that. Because there's no standard. There's no standard at all. It happened exactly this way. Well, the Southern version tells it differently, and the history says this, and the scholars disagree. All of that is fun, but none of it's the point. The point is, Joseph, whoever he was, wherever he came from, whether he ever breathed air or not, shows the power of love. Love is the point. He shows the loving response. The point isn't whether Joseph existed. The point is, we can be Joseph. Our love can save the day. That's the point. It's not about Joseph. It's about us. 
LGBTQ kids need a Joseph. Refugee children need a Joseph. Kids growing up with homophobia and transphobia and anti-Semitism and racism and xenophobia on the rise need a Joseph. What every single one of those kids needs is Christians that have been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what they need. People that's minds have been renewed by the message, uh, the person, the work of Jesus Christ. Right? Those that have been reconciled to God, calling out to others that they too can be reconciled, and then living out that reconciliation in their, in their own lives. One of the things, again, talking about the early church, that they got really, really right and they were not going to give up on was the reality that they were going to live out this love that they had been shown to others as well. And that would be something that I would say that really, uh, if anybody has a beef with the modern conservative biblical church, that would be the beef. I don't think we do that really well. I think that's why a lot of people do kind of go over to progressive Christianity because unfortunately um, they are really, um, really good at that. I don't say unfortunately, I, I just, that they, they're just really good at that. And one of the things that I think biblical conservative Christians could do is really understand the history of early Christianity, look at that and go, wow, we're really lacking in that. And then, then demonstrating that love and that generosity uh, to those around us. There are ways to do that that don't compromise on um, on truths that uh, that are held. Right? You you can still say um, we can take we need to understand that we need to take care of refugees while also saying that borders in countries are good. There's still a way to say we need to love and care for LGBTQ plus kids while also holding the reality that scripture calls uh, you know, th these things sins. There's still, and here's the, here's the other thing. There's a way to say gossip is terrible while also still loving the one that gossips about you, right? All of these facets, there's a way that the early church said, we are going to love and care for the very people that don't like us, and we're going to love and care for the very people that are that are outcasts or that are genuinely oppressed, uh, while also holding up our uh, what the Bible says we should do. There are ways to do that uh, in, in ways that are faithful, and the early church just really demonstrates that well. Um for sure. And I think we really need to read that, understand that better, and um, ask God to transform our hearts and minds to be, to be those people. Where fear and hatred and injustice dominate, love can still save. It's probably the only thing that can. The question isn't, was there a Joseph? The question is, will we dare to be Joseph today? Will we offer a love that saves? We can. We must. And I believe we will. And this is the good news. Amen. All right, that is the full sermon right? The whole point is love. It's all about us. We look at the Bible and say, hey, it's whatever we want it to be, guys. Like, I mean, read the parts you like, and if you don't like it, you know, I don't know, just do whatever you want. Boy, that escalated quickly. Yeah. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Super fast. And it will. Right? If, if you do not understand the scriptures as being the words that God has given his people through faithful servants, um, it's going to be really easy for you to get off track really, really fast. So let, let's, let's critique this sermon as we do all the sermons. Did he read the scripture? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he read uh, a pretty good part of 1 Corinthians. Uh, well, I've lost it now on my phone here, but he did do the whole love chapter uh, or part of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is what it was. Um, so he did read scripture. The second thing is, did he use context and culture to exegete it? Not at all. In fact, he interjected that love is discipline and then kind of preached off of that a little bit, even though that's not technically what's in the text, and completely ignored the context in which Paul was actually talking to the Corinthians, uh, what he was talking to them about, and misusing even what uh, how Paul is using love and defining it there within the context uh, of, 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 uh, of Corinth. 
Ironically, he does get discipline correct in regards to as what discipline is supposed to do. Though, as I said, I think he would totally disagree about church discipline and how it should be enacted, uh, even though he clearly understands what discipline is. And lastly, did he preach the gospel? No, not at all. In fact, he, at the very last part there, defined the good news as just loving people. Um, the good news isn't simply loving people. The good news is that God loved us. A faithful God loved a faithless people, and so much so that even though he has presented his standard to us and could fully keep us accountable to that standard because it's written on our hearts, he chooses to send himself, uh, be our sacrifice, make a way to be reconciled to him. Even though that was totally unnecessary, he does it because he is patient and kind, and he wants to be reconciled with his creation and provides us a way to do that in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That is the good news. That is the news that has gone through the world in every culture, in every context, in every time, and said, worship Jesus, Christ is king. And that is the definitive truth that Christians throughout time have held on to, that is the central truth, that they have not wavered from, that Christ is king. You are not. And how do you know how to follow him well? Well, he has left us his word. He has left us the teachings uh, that he, that Jesus passed on to the apostles and they have passed on to believers. And we know what his standard is and how to follow it. We have it. And if you understand that, uh, you will understand the scriptures as that. But if not, you will use them as an inspirational book, not an inspired one. And that is the difference. And that is why this church to me is a joke. Um, they can dress up all they want. They can use the scriptures if they care to. But at the end of the day, it's not a church. And they're not using the scriptures, using an inspirational book that they choose to use alongside of teachings of Buddha and the Quran. And therefore, that should tell you everything you need to know about this quote-unquote church and this quote-unquote pastors. Remember, exegesis over eisegesis every single time. Guys, hopefully you found this was helpful. If you did, make sure you leave a like, make sure you leave a comment, and make sure you subscribe. I'll talk to you later.